Driving Culture 4. This is High Beast Radio. I'm your host, Madrell Stinney, here with my co-host, Kevin Wong, and we're sitting down with Matthew Williams of Alix. How's it going, Matt? It's going good. Awesome. So, um, yeah, I mean, just current events, like recently you moved out to Italy. How's that been? It's been good. I mean, um, you know, I'd been splitting my time between New York City and Italy for the past two years, going back and forth when we were just doing two collections a year with uh, with women's. And now that we just started the men's collection this year, you know, the pace of, of having to develop and, you know, each season naturally, you know, I want to do more. I want want to try new things. And it just became a lot to travel back and forth um, every month. So we just decided in this kind of stage of building the brand that we just needed to make that commitment to be there and and uh, be working really closely with all the suppliers to 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 make all the stuff really special, like make it feel like it was touched by hand, you know, in this in this world today where everything is spit out of a computer and and made by a machine, I think for me, what I want in clothing is is to have it feel some kind of emotion or soul. And that only comes by the touch of a human hand. So I can't send a tech pack and expect something to, to come back feeling that way. So down to, you know, every small little aspect of, of a piece, um, you know, we really try to make it better. And so, like, the brand is really something that is an evolution, not like a revolution each season. So we constantly are, are building upon similar silhouettes and fabrics and, and becoming more proficient each season in, in making those things, which essentially gives back to the customer so that each season they're able to buy a variation, an update, or a new thing that, that we've become better at by all the things we've learned season after season. Rather than starting from scratch, you know, each each thing it each season it being a brand new fabric or or silhouette, um, it's hard to to make it to that level, you know. Yeah. That's why like, you know, uh, certain types of clothing that are made for military or sport are so good because they're made for function and they've been tested and it takes you know like yeah. like uh like we did that speedy collaboration right right yeah so that's like a motorcycle jacket company they spend four years developing one jacket before they release it you know what i mean like we could never do that r and d making a normal jacket so that's a kind of example of like maybe why that that piece feels feels special you know what i mean and and when you bring that into to a fashion context it you know i don't know it has a a different mood about it so kind of just trying to to capture some of that um that development you know that i really appreciate yeah and um recently you guys started a menswear line like how's that been i mean it's amazing cuz i've always wanted to to do menswear and you know make clothes that that i want to wear so yeah it's it's just super fun um I'm just really happy to be doing it. Yeah. Initially, when the brand started, like, it was intended for it to be a women's wear line, or was it unisex? No. When, when the... Well, that's, like, kind of a loaded question, because, like, clothes are just for people. Like, yeah. I think it's super cool when girls wear uh, guys' clothes. Like, my wife wears my clothes all the time. And I'm sure there was some women's pieces that we made that were inspired by, like, some men's silhouettes. But then it's super rad when guys wear the girl stuff, you know what I mean? But at the beginning, it was women's clothes. Um, and then I had al always wanted to do men's. It's just like, you only have so much time, so much resources. So um, I just felt the need to just begin with women's. Yeah. And what kind of, um, I guess, prompted the the final kind of jump to doing men's now? Um. I, you know, I really wanted to do it. I think, like, there was a lot of supporters of Aleeks that really wanted to do it. A lot of guys were wearing the women's stuff. Yeah. I think there was a lot of people that didn't know that we didn't do men's clothes. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Because uh, there was, like, the bomber jackets and the hiking boots and the belts and accessories. And people, guys were really into that at the beginning. So it was easy. You know, if you talk to 90% of people that wear clothing, 
they mostly just like it for the clothing piece. They don't mm -hmm. always yeah. know like all of the little backstory yeah. of like the brand and the designer and everything. Mm -hmm. So for instance, like a denim pant is, is, is kind of a good example that like the pocket spacing is really specific for like a women's body. Mm -hmm. But then when like guys put on that pant, it's cool, you know, if, if a guy has is more of like a, a slim frame or a petite silhouette, but I, I was a little bit like, oh, it's like dudes wearing the women's jeans and then guys don't know that we don't make men's clothes thinking that's the men's thing. And it just was like, all right, I got to just got to start it now. Mm -hmm. There's like enough of a demand of guys buying the women's stuff. Let's mm -hmm. let's do it, you know? Yeah. But we did it quite slow. Like the 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 store, the clo the collection that's in the stores now was kind of like a preview. It was mm -hmm. a small like. 30, 40 piece collection. And then the spring one that's delivering next month is, mm -hmm. is more of like the first full range. Mm -hmm. And is it going to be pretty separate <clears throat> in terms of like the concept or is it very much? No, they fluid? like, it's like the girl and guy and, yeah. and we do share materials and fabrics mm -hmm. and cause uh, you know, a lot of times when we develop something from scratch, it's still like a huge fabric minimum. And right, right. I try to find stuff that, that can work, you know, between between both. So in speaking of the concept, like, um, what was the initial concept behind Alix? It's named after your daughter, but what was the dialogue that you were trying to create with the brand? Um, well, it, it's funny because it's being, becoming a designer has been something that I've always wanted to do since I was a teenager. Like, I can't remember wanting to do like a different pr profession in my adult life. So when I kind of went, uh, you know, through the years of art direction and creative direction with uh, musicians and, and brands, it was still always something I wanted to do. And I, I got to a place where I was, you know, about to turn 30 and, and wanted to just like give it a, sh a shot. And, you know, all my other work that I had done in the past had been collaboration with others and trying to like elevate um, another person's idea to the best that I could. And I felt the need to, for this brand to be something that's like super personal because we're, you know, I, I know we're in a place where like we don't, the world doesn't need more clothes, you know? Mm -hmm. So, so what I can offer is, is like storytelling or, or something that's personal, you know, mm -hmm. and, and also design. I think that's something that needs to be spoken about a bit more is like a lot of the brands that, you know, Hypebeast supports and guys that like Alix support and girls that like Alix support, they're, they're designed clothes. Like that has value. There's value in design. Whereas like Zara or, or H&M, that's like clothing, you know, that you buy that to keep your body warm. I know maybe people buy, people buy it if they don't feel the need to spend money on expensive clothes. Yeah. But like, I don't really believe in the cycle that, that the clothes that we design need to go on sale because they still have value. It's, it's designed clothes, like, like old raft pieces, old um, Visvim pieces. Mm -hmm. Those things still stand this test of time. I don't right. understand right. why we create this system where they lose value after six months. That's just kind of going into this, this bad format that, that makes people feel like the value is less because it's old, which is absolutely not true. You're paying for the design of that piece. Mm -hmm. If you want to just keep your body warm, there's a lot of other things you should spend your money on. Right. So, um, I think that's going back to the fact that like, it was important to me to try to like reach towards making something that had like a permanence to it and a, and a permanent emotion to it that like, when you buy something from the brand, you feel like you can own it for a while. You feel like you're not wasting your money and you feel like, we're going to be something that still means something 10 years from now. So mm -hmm. choosing the name Aleeks was a way for me to, to put like a personal and permanent uh, stamp on my project. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you, um, you brought up a good point, you know, like clothes being made specifically for the runway and then clothes being made to go on sale. Um, about like a few years ago, like a lot of brands were struggling trying to fit within the fashion calendar. Um, is that something that you face as well? Yeah, this, the calendar is really crazy um, because there's like so many different calendars. There's like men's, women's, right? 
Then there's the calendar of that the stores need to close. Mm. Then there's the calendar of your the, the actual manufacturers of the clothes. And then there's the calendar of the fabric. And they all don't link. Yeah. And so there's always somebody, there's always some strain at certain points. And keeping up with the calendar that is set right now is really difficult as an independent brand. So, yeah, it, it's really hard. We're thinking about, like, moving to, like, a calendar that's a bit more spread out. Um, I mean, it's not, like, official yet, but we're thinking about just showing the men's and women's as two separate collections in mm-hmm. June and January. So then that gives us, like, six months for the production, and also it allows, like, the stores to to have the stuff on the rack longer because mm-hmm. a lot of times you'll ship, you know, outerwear, right, in August or September. Mm-hmm. Doesn't get cold until November. Yeah. It goes on sale in December. And then you have spring delivering in January. Right. Still cold. You have, like, T-shirts and shorts. And then it's on sale again in April, May. And it's, it just doesn't really make sense, you know? Yeah. yeah. I really like, you know, you have to get to a place where, like, your brand is strong enough where people are going to buy it no matter what, you know, there's supporters of the brand and the stores are going to support you no matter what. But, like, what VizVim does is amazing. They say, okay, we're going to ship the clothes to you, but you can't put the clothes on sale for nine months to mm-hmm. a year. Mm-hmm. Wow. And then it creates value to what they're doing, you know? like, yeah. And, um you know, hopefully we'll be at a place soon where we can do something like that, you know? But right now it's like, we're still second season doing men's, mm-hmm. like people want to have uh, a way out if that they can like sell the stuff if for some reason it doesn't move at full price or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. But that kind of pace slowed down a little bit, I think just allows for a uh, better product being able to be made. Definitely. Um, and like the stores being happier and at the end of the day, like, I think the customer appreciating what they have, I think everyone needs to just, like, appreciate the shit that they have longer. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? No, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> the turnaround is, is kind of crazy nowadays, you know? Even within the same brand, it's like you buy something and then the next season comes on, you're like, oh, man, I need that now. Yeah. And um, I need to update my, you know, wardrobe or whatnot. Yeah, and the trends, like, the trends change fast as well, too. Like, you know, maybe one style might be in like, you know, for a few months and then that, that just goes by. Like, is that difficult? Like, as a designer, well, like, you know, if you are trying to chase those trends or is it just easier just to, like, design within your own wheelhouse? I don't, I don't uh, design with, like, trends in mind. It's, it's, um, there's not enough time in the day to, like, for me to think about that or care. And the other reason is, I, you know, I'm choosing fabric sometimes a year before it ever goes into a garment. So even if you were thinking about making something that was on trend by the time you've chosen the fabric made the garment there's a new trend mm-hmm. yeah, behind, yeah. so i don't know for for me i don't really care about that stuff because i'm designing more from like a personal aesthetic you mm-hmm. know what i mean and and more instinct yeah. i think when you go up high enough um the most talented and people in the world design from instinct mm-hmm. yeah. and um it's more about people choosing to kind of engage with the world that they're creating or not. Yeah. So, and how is like you know moving to Italy changed that? Like you know you're gonna be, you're in Italy now. You're you're away from the states. Like you're do you feel disconnected almost in a sense, or is like you know is it inspiring you to create like newer things? Yeah, I mean I think disconnected in a good way where it's like, you know I'm just focusing on my craft and mm-hmm. and and working. You know we maybe this kind of move wouldn't be so easy five years ago where we didn't have like Skype and Mm -hmm. FaceTime and you know Instagram and and there's a way to keep connected and tuned in if I want to but you know nothing beats like the physicality of of actually going to places and meeting people and talking people and I still do that all the time you know I even though I'm not Instagramming my life I'm still like out and in the streets and like with people um, I'm just not like documenting it for everybody to see. I think, you know, 
it, it's only been good, honestly. Like when I went to Cuba the past four days, yeah, there's no internet or phone service there, and it was really cool just to like only worry about like what I was having for each meal during the day and kind of mm-hmm. like roaming. Like I, that was my favorite part about living in New York City when I first moved there ten years ago. Was just like walking outside, roaming around, uh, and kind of just running into people on the street or like hitting a store that you kind of pass by and like discovering something. And now when I'm in New York, I'm mostly like working in my house on the computer for half Mm -hmm. the day. Mm -hmm. And then I go outside and like meet a friend for a second. But that kind of like, like the emails and like the, the constant communication on computers or phones has taken away that roaming time, which Mm -hmm. I like really loved. Right. But, now when you go Rome, you're like alone a lot of times too, because everybody's inside on their computers. <laughs> True. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I guess it's just you know, it's just good to be disconnected. Is all yeah. I'm saying sometimes. I mean, kind of going off that a bit too. You know, how affected are you as a creative or um, you know a designer um, by you know the noise from the outside, from social media, from all these kind of things? Or do you try to like shut it off when you're trying to create, or do you really you know, lay emphasis on what's going on and your the reception of your stuff and anything like that. It's weird, man. Um, I don't really know what's real mm-hmm. because everything's like, like for instance on Instagram, it's it's so aggregated to your preferences. Yeah, you don't even know what the algorithm is really of what they're showing you. Sure, it's like things you've liked, or I'm sure they can tell how long you've stayed on an image or something. Yeah. But, like, sometimes I'm on my Instagram and I don't even know, like, w- is what I'm looking at everything that's going on? Or yeah. is it Just tailored is to it you? Tailored to me? Is yeah. it actually real? Is it actually as big as it seems? Mm-hmm. What I feel about our brand now is that we're kind of more quietly doing our thing. We're not, like, as, you know, in your face mm-hmm. everywhere like, like other things are at the moment. And I, I'm happy about that right. um, because I think it's, like, maybe authentic. People are just, like, into it because they're into it. You know yeah. what I mean? But even if I wanted to, I don't even know. I'm not Machiavellian enough to understand how to connect that circuit. And, ma- like, there's yeah. other people that are super good at that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just from a different generation where it's still not second nature to me to figure out how to do that. Yeah. I'm more like... You know, if I just stay by the code of doing something that connects with me, projecting imagery and pieces that I'm really into, mm-hmm. then that will just attract other people yeah. that are like, you know what, that resonates with me too. Yeah. That's cool. And then, like, if there's a moment of emotion and authenticity that's created, then people can share that. And then that moment can then be conveyed on. Right. But, like, like planning something for a moment on social yeah, media yeah, or digitally, yeah. like, yeah, yeah I, I don't think that's, uh, I mean, I don't know how to do that. Yeah. So I think more documenting a, a, a real thing is, is maybe the most powerful Right, and then tool. Kind, of, kind of seeing yeah. how people react to it genuinely versus trying to create something for you. Yeah, definitely, yeah. Yeah, and you you work with, you know, your wife on the brand and then, like, you know, you're close friends with Nick Knight and he helps you out with your catalogs and stuff. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Is it a lot easier, like, you know, working with people that are closely knit to, like, you know, give, delivering, like, you know, your vision for the brand? Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's it's like that with every aspect. Um, it's about those relationships that that you have with people and, and it allows um, for for things to run smooth and... and and people, you know, give a lot when they when they care about you personally and the brand. But there's a lot of new people that I'm working with now too. Mm-hmm. Um, like, and it's just it's just a process of of getting used to to working together too. I mean, yeah, there's just a whole there's a whole bunch of people that I that I work with on on imagery and showroom stuff and collaborations and so. Speaking of imagery, you don't do that many graphics. Is there like a reason behind that? Well, at the it's funny you say that because at the beginning we didn't because I wanted the cl- like 
the clothes, like the, the cut and sew to just be what the focus was. And then the past two seasons, we launched this uh, area of the brand called Leaks Visual. Mm. And that's like uh, a more basic and graphic area of the brand. It's not, it has its own like Instagram handle, but we don't push it like so forward all the time on social media, but it does exist in the stores if you go in and there's around like 20 graphics a season in that section. Yeah. And so that uh, area of the brand is like kind of my step into experimenting with sustainable method of make. So like all the t-shirts are used um, using textile are made using textile waste and plastic bottles. Oh, nice. So we like collect the the remnants from the cutting floor. So you, the fabric's rolled yeah, out, yeah, they cut yeah. a t-shirt, then there's like around 10 to 15% of fabric like falls on the floor. So we collect that, yeah. make new yarn from it, and then make the shirts from it. So one man's e trash. Yeah, well <laughs> each uh, each shirt saves like a 1000 gallons of water. Wow, and wow. and my thing was like yeah, I hope our t-shirts get kept for like a decade, but something like a t-shirt, you know, after all the tour merch, all the, you know, the Ben Trill shirts, all of the things that, that I had done in the past, you know, how much of that is still in people's closets? How much of that ended up hitting a dump? Right, right. And I'd rather just for something like a graphic tee, just try to try to at least do my part as that being kind of like a benchmark of, of just trying to use sustainability yeah. in our process. Yeah. We don't really communicate it that forwardly, like yeah. it's on the hang tag, but I think it's something like, you know, all like we just have this planet, right? And you know, clean water is kind of one of the most important things. Yeah. I want to, I want to at least try to have some part of my belief system about the world and like enter into how I make clothes. So mm -hmm. I do care about the environment and that's kind of my little way of being like, okay, this is a benchmark. This is available to designers to make t-shirts in this way. They still feel just as good. Mm -hmm. The customer doesn't realize that it's not that. And you've now allowed for, you know, different things like food to be grown on that land mm -hmm. or water not to be used. Like we saved a million gallons of water this season alone just by, wow. yeah. just by, uh, that's cool that you have the metrics for that as well. You know? Yeah. Well, it's just 1000 yeah. per shirt. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Times that by how right, many shirts. Right, right, right. That's cool. Yeah. You think a lot of kind of designers and, and people that produce, you know, objects in general kind of have that in mind. Yeah. Well, I know like a hundred percent of Nike's, um, uh, you know, football, mm -hmm basketball baseball clothing is uh, upcycled too that's cool and yeah. I know like like all the soccer jerseys I think it, a lot of a lot of brands do it it's just still the stigma about like how to talk about it where mm. people don't feel like they're being preached to about how yeah, they need yeah, to live yeah. their life or whatever so I take a more low-key approach to it it's something I personally believe in you know what I mean and I think it should just be kind of a standard when making certain types of things, right. you know? Right. Yeah. But like a leather jacket, for instance, that's something that maybe will stay in the cycle for like 15, 20 years. Mm -hmm. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Yeah. yeah. That is sustainable because it it's being used. Yeah. You yeah, know what I mean? Another leather, leather jacket, you know? Yeah. yeah. But, you know, a t-shirt or like a white tee. Yeah. Mm. You know, we do three-pack white tees, too, now in that same process, nice. um, which I'm really stoked on. Do you think yeah. as you grow, as, like, as, as a designer, like, you'll begin to, like, you know, dig deeper with your beliefs and then putting those into clothing? Like, yeah. Well, they're already in there subtly. I mean, you could know a lot about me if you you kind of, like, read into the, the cliff notes in the, in the brand, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Is that like, fun for you to, to kind of you know kind of throw out little hints and then by the end of it y y do you think of this kind of grander thing where people can look back at the brand and kind of you know see a bit of you or see a bit of what your process or see a bit of you know your family and whatnot well it's not really from like the standpoint of like like an ego because mm -hmm. i also have this uh this like resistance to like this narcissistic es exercise of being somebody that feels the need to auth author the world. I call it like the Diddy effect. Like you're going to drink Ciroc at the club. You're going to sing my song in the shower. Yeah. You're going to wear Sean John <laughs> on the way, you know, to your meeting. 
and 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 spray my cologne, you know, yeah. like before yeah. you go to work. Right, right. You right. know what I mean? Uh, I don't necessarily feel I'm not creating from a point that I feel like I have better ideas than everybody or that like I need to operate in each medium that exists. But the artists that have come before me that I look up to and I try and emulate, they hide elements of themselves into the work, you know? I think so many great artists in so many different mediums from film to art and music, I, they're just, I think, leaves a, uh, you know, like a soul or emotion in the piece. So I'm more doing it from like, that's something I can offer that's a, a unique perspective that makes what I do different. Yeah. So it's, it's just coming from that place, but it's not coming from a place of narcissism or, yeah. or ego. Almost like a natural kind of progression. It's just, it's just what, it's just a, a it's just a, a method of, of process that I use that, uh, that allows me to feel like I'm doing something that is, is personal and unique to me and yeah, different yeah, yeah. than what other people could necessarily offer. Right, right. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, you seem to be like, you know, in a, in a very like, self-aware hyper-conscious state right now like what was it like your very first initially like once you dropped out of college you know like did you always have plans like next where it was like all right cool I'm gonna do this fashion thing yeah well I tried to go to Parsons mm -hmm. and I didn't get in um I was like working for a small brand in LA at the time and I had like made some samples and stuff but they you know they said my grades weren't good and I I couldn't like sketch good enough and so, but I still really wanted to do it. So I just, I just started working in the business and my parents didn't really support the whole thing. And they're like, you know, you're going to be back going to college in a few years. But I kind of just, uh, I don't want to call it like a calling, but it is something that I've always wanted to do. And I really, really love doing it. Like I, I, I mean, besides my family and close friends, like, I really enjoy the process of making clothing. It's like, I don't know, it's like building something with my hands. Like, I really like that process, you know? So, it's always, it's all, I just kind of went for it and, and ended up being something that I could continue doing, knock on wood, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and you, you mentioned, <laughs> like, you refer to it not necessarily, like, you know, you wanting to call it as a calling and stuff, but, like, once you have that feeling or that sense where it's like, all right, there's something I really want to do, I want to follow it, like, how do you get from that point to actually following through with it? Well, I always say this to people when they're like, I want to do a brand or, like, give me some advice. It's like, the best advice I could give anybody is to just stay really close to somebody that is doing what you want to do mm -hmm. and help them for as long as you can until they basically pass you the torch mm. and like set you off on your own boat you know with enough food and resources to yeah. make your own island somewhere else you know mm -hmm. what i mean like it's like i was lucky enough to be trained by people that are really really great and and then that allowed me to to then be able to move on and do something on my own. But I, you know, I'm 32 years old. I started Elix when I was 29 and I started working in fashion when I was 19. Wow. So that was like 10 years of, of, of real life work before I then took the step to do my own brand. And I think that's given me a, a better chance of success in, in my own project. I think we live in a world where, you know, if you're not like, famous and successful before you're 25 it's like you're looked at like what are you doing but right. at the end of the day it's like there's a few rare gems that really like keep it going for 10 years mm -hmm. but a lot of you know young young uh talents just are like boom boom mm -hmm. i mean like hiroshi said it to me best he was like it's just about continuing keep going you know yeah. what i mean that's that's what it's about this is like this is a super long game yeah and that's the reason like we haven't shown yet mm -hmm. that's so many reasons why you know we're, i'm building the brand how i'm building it is because at the end of the day i, I want to be super super proud of of what i spent my life doing i want to create pieces 
not only that I'm proud of, but like when you look at it, it's like this cannot be duplicated by somebody else, right. you know? So that's basically it. How is it to see like, you know, um, like your friends like <clears throat> Virgil and Heron, like, you know, to go on to doing what you're doing as well and starting like a brand of their own and becoming S successful in their own right? Super happy. Yeah. yeah, we were, I was just with them both last night and it was really fun. We were telling uh, like, just old Ben Trill stories and yeah. <laughs> it was it was it was fun like uh catching up about all that that was a fun moment but what it's cool because like each of us are doing such different things too mm -hmm. you know what I mean I think maybe that's something that not everybody realized it's like yeah. what I said about like our work had been so collaborative in the past like for each of us to just be doing our own thing and 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 it being successful but also having a different aesthetic is, is super cool. And I, I love what both of them are doing. I mean, yeah, it's really, really cool. Do you feel like you're learning about like, you know, them individually as you see like their brands grow and stuff? Like you mentioned like your work being a lot like really collaborative, but all of your guys' narratives seem like really different. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, definitely. I, I, I definitely see that when I look at their stuff for sure. So uh, as far as like the story goes, you know, you went, you dropped out of college, then you started doing like, you know, art direction, creative direction, then you did the bin trail for a minute, and then you went on to do a leaks and stuff. Yeah. All right, cool. So um, with that being said, like, you know, talk about that, that transition from like, you know, the, the band breaks up, Heron referred to it as like, you know, a boy, brand, a boy band, um, <laughs> the bin trail day. So the band breaks up and then you go on to do a leaks. Like, what was that? What was that jump like? Uh, well, it's funny because it, it wasn't like. Bentrill wasn't like my job. Mm -hmm. That was just like a fun thing that we were do. doing with our friends. Like I was working for Ye at the time yeah. as his art director. So like Virgil and I had the same job. Yeah. And uh, it was more like, you know, I had a family. I wanted to be with my wife and kids. I wanted to finally start this brand. So it was, it was hard because I wasn't with, you know, all the people I had spent so many years with every day and like, um, you know, I was, I really loved all the stuff that I got to do with Ye and, and Virgil and, and, you know, you're such like a family when you're like working and traveling mm -hmm. all the time. And, um, and so it was like, it was sad in a way to, you know, to have that chapter kind of end in my life, but yeah. then really happy to then begin, uh, this new chapter. This new chapter. Mm -hmm. And it was just like a quiet like year and a half of, of going and building and figuring out exactly what I wanted to do and then um, and then doing it. But yeah. During, before it like, you know, clicked and you were like, okay, this is this like the next project's going to be a leaks, like were there ever any moments where you had like self doubt? Uh yeah. I think it's like not self doubt like maybe like I don't doubt myself mm -hmm. in that mm -hmm. way like but more like you you're I don't know I'm, you're always I'm always like gut checking if something's good or not you yeah. know what I mean what makes you um like you know very inspired about the future for leaks it's it's hard to like l like I do look in the future of things that I that I dream of doing but it's hard to to look too far and kind of live in live in this dream world of of imagination i'm more focused in the present about having every day i wake up and i try to get through the list of things that that i feel like need to get done towards working towards that thing but but uh there's enough happening in the present that i that that are like big dreams and things that are actually like happening right now that I'm just focusing on that. I'm not, not, you know, there's still, <laughs> there's so much happening right now. I'm not really thinking too far ahead. Yeah. And a great way that we like to end our podcast with is that, you know, if you were to go back, say for instance, to your, like your younger self, when you first had these dreams of like doing fashion and stuff and then give that person some words of advice, what would you say? I mean, I think the thing I already said about like working closely with somebody mm. that you want to emulate is is really good advice but you know i obviously like did that i don't i don't have any i don't have like regrets so it's hard to like offer offer new advice like anything that i've done 
you know, in the past that was like difficult or painful or, or, or was hard. It only like has led me to like new experience and understanding and brought me more into like a positive place, even at those moments in my life where I was like quite down, you know what I mean? So man, you just gotta, I would just, the, I would give advice to other people, which is just like, just don't be afraid and, and try and, and just keep going. You know what I mean? That's, that's it. For sure. Yeah. Thanks for stopping by. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thanks, guys.